Welcome everyone, this is Dawn Williams, Senior Director of Conferences, Meetings and Events for National Minority Supplier Development Council. Thank you for joining us for today's NMSDC COVID-19 Virtual Town Hall. Momentarily, we will be joined by Adrian Trimble, President and CEO of NMSDC, for today's session, addressing questions regarding all programs enacted to support minority businesses. Great, thank you, Don, and good afternoon, everyone. We're so glad to be with you one more week as we continue our White House series. Um, we are so glad that you took time out of your schedules to join us today. We do have more information to share with you, so we're, we're really excited to jump right back in. This is our sixth White House series, and we've been really appreciative of the federal government's uh, objectives to work with us, their, their willingness to share information, and to make sure that we're getting information out to our constituents as quickly as possible. For those of you who might not be as familiar with NMSDC, if you're newcomers joining us, uh, the National Minority Supplier Development Council is the premier organization for supplier diversity. And we, our goal is, our mission is to advance connections between our certified minority businesses and corporate America. We have uh, a certification, which just really serves as the gold standard to ensure that those companies that are doing business as minority entities are indeed minority owned, operated, and controlled. In addition to that, we have a number of events such as this one to help connect our certified minority businesses to corporate America. And we also put on training education sessions and awareness to help our MBEs and our corporate members get access to tools and resources that help them be more effective and efficient in their roles. And third, and the fourth, fourth objective of NMSDC is to ensure that we have advocacy initiatives in place. And that is why I'm so thrilled about one of our panelists today who's going to talk to you about some of the work that we're going to be doing together to help NMSDC in its advocacy efforts. So while we are getting information, working to help you get through this COVID-19 pandemic, and as we turn to reopen the economy, just a couple things we want to make sure that you know that we're doing on your behalf. You may have already received in your, in your email inbox a survey. It's a, it's a data collection that we are trying to gather to help us understand from those of you who are still in need of funding or resources, financial support to help you sustain your business operations. It's really important that you take a moment to complete this survey because this data is being used not just for NMSDC, but as we are entering into conversations with White House officials, federal government uh, officials, those who are looking to find ways to ensure that as we talk about resources and financial support for small businesses, then minority businesses are not forgotten, that we are, the, are included in, the, in those efforts. So please, if you have a moment, please take time to complete the survey. We're gonna keep it open until 11.59 Eastern time tonight. Your voice and your input is critical so that we can make sure that we are advocating on your behalf. Last week, our town hall focused on what is the administration's vision of economic recovery for minority business? It was a very uh, engaging conversation, had great insights to help us prepare our MBEs to get ready to restart the economy and reopen their businesses. I wanna take a moment to thank those panelists who joined us. Uh, we have Paul Teller, who is the Deputy Assistant to the President and Director of Strategic Initiatives for the Vice President. We had Jerron Smith, who is the, the, the Deputy Assistant to the President for the White House Office of American Innovation. And we did something different last week. We had our MBEs join us to ask very specific and direct questions of our panelists. So thank you to Terry Quinton, who's the CEO of Q2 Marketing and Alliance of Diversity Printers, Carlton O'Neill, who is the managing partner of Lightspeed EDU, and Bonnie Nice, president and CEO of Fidget Branding. We had our Corporate Plus member join us, Sue Batia, who's the founder of Rose International. And then we had one of our affiliate presidents join us, Sharon Pender, who is the president and CEO of the Capital Regents Minority Supplier Development Council. We also want to give a special thank you to Don McNeely, uh, president and founder of Minority Business News, for sponsoring and, and putting together our post video edits. If you missed the, the webcast last week, you can catch the replay of it on nmsdc.org on our website. We have all of our previous sessions located there so that you can tune in at any time to hear the information that you might have missed if you could not join us live. So we are ready to jump into today's discussion. Thank you all so much for, again for joining us. And this, this week we're gonna focus on addressing questions that, that's regarding all programs that have been enacted to support our minority businesses. We wanna make sure that we are answering any questions that still may linger or be unclear to you in terms of what you need to do to get access and resources to help you. 
and as we start navigating through the COVID-19 pandemic. And we also want to make sure that we are able to address any actions that will be needed in ongoing legislation or support that's going to be put in place to support our small and minority businesses. So as we get ready for this conversation, as I mentioned, one of the key areas that we really want to focus on is the advocacy work for NMSDC. So I'm so pleased to introduce NMSDC's newest consulting partner working with us, Henry Childs II. Now, Henry is going to be working as a special assistant to help me with our government affairs strategy. Many of you who've been around the NMSDC network for some time knew the NMSDC has always been had a very engaging government relations strategy. We want to make sure that we reenact that, get it in place, because we know these next 24 months are going to be critical for our minority businesses to understand how they need to navigate through the federal government. Henry is going to help shape those efforts for us. His first priority will be the establishment of our Minority Wealth Commission, which I'm going to ask him to talk a little bit about, but it's going to be a collaborative effort that we will have with other strategic partners to help us have one voice for minority business advocacy. We also want to make sure that we are working together to help drive growth and sustainability and helping make sure that our leaders, our federal, federal government representatives, understand what we need for our minority businesses to be successful. Before Henry took on this role, most of us knew him as the National Director of the U.S. Department of Commerce's Minority Business Development Agency. He was the 17th National Director that was appointed to that role. Uh, in that role, we know Henry did some amazing things. He put in place a number of innovative programs to help minority businesses. He's a data junkie, which has been so helpful to help us really understand what does the data tell us and how do we leverage that data to make sure that we are using it to help our minority businesses and tell the story. He talks about the fact that we have, what, 14 million minority-owned companies in this country. How do we make sure that everybody knows that and understands the power of that and leveraging that and make sure there are resources to be able to help all of those who are, who are uh, minority businesses? Prior to being uh, his appointment at MBDA, Mr. Child serves as the Economic Development Administration Senior Advisor and Director of Strategic Initiatives. And in that role, he advised EDA on economic development issues and foster partnerships with other federal agencies as well as national and international economic development organizations. He was also the policy advisor to the White House of Office Public Liaison. He worked closely with, White House, with the White House Office of American Innovation on economic development issues for urban communities and urban revitalization. He holds a Juris Doctorate from St. Louis University School of Law, and he is a graduate, has a graduate certificate in international and comparative law. So Henry comes very well qualified, and we are so thankful that he has stepped into this role where he can work more broadly to advocate on behalf of minority businesses. So Henry, tell us a little bit about what made you even take on this role and what is it that you'd like to see accomplished? I, first of all, uh, need. So I, I'll just start off with a short story about me. Both my parents are ministers. So I just, all my life, I've been wanting to serve people. Um, I'm be honest with you, sometimes it's a burden because I want to get out there and get some money, which I preach everybody to do. But in times like this, to me, when we look back on this in 20 years, this is going to be the most important moment of our lives. And I've just, I've not seen enough people that are focused on helping the most vulnerable population. Um, I've been very fortunate enough in my position where, you know, I can afford to eat, keep a roof over my head, grow my business. But there's a lot of people who literally day by day are just struggling to eat. And the question is, who is fighting for those people? Um, we've seen, you know, um, different groups get their fair share, and I'm glad that, you know, industry got taken care of. I'm glad that, you know, corporations, businesses, but we're really fighting for the people that we see every single day who are literally wondering, how am I going to feed my child? How am I going to keep the lights on? And that is my soul and my passion. So I took on this role for the commission because, I think it's very important that we have a unified voice. It's more difficult for Congress to make decisions when they're getting 10 to 15 different ideas and they conflict. So what we want to do is we want to send lists of recommendations that make sure we take care of everybody, we're on the same page and make sure that they realize minority and small are not synonymous. We will be very crystal clear that minority communities and minority businesses are suffering the hardest, and we, we want our fair share. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Earlier this week, we um, were able to host a, a small roundtable with members of the White House administration, with uh, Jerron and uh, Jerron Smith, and with uh, Chris Gilberton again. They have been so wonderful in helping us share information, raise the issues up to them. One of the things that we've talked about is our MBEs really struggle with understanding how do they navigate the federal government and the opportunities there. Can you talk a little bit about what you see in terms of how we can work together to make sure that we are positioning our MBEs to know what those opportunities are going to be? Because as you said, this is going to be one of probably the most important times in our history that we can have opportunities that will be so open that can really change the whole trajectory of our minority businesses. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. So I think the first thing in order to know where things are, you, it, the first is key to influence them. So our number one strategy is we want to work with con Congress so they know what our exact needs are. And we want to influence legislation. Um, it's so hard to fix stuff after it's written. And I, I'm very proud of the work you're doing, NMSDC is doing, minority chambers are doing to try to fix stuff after the fact but we wanna get in front of it so that we know that our minority businesses are taken care of. So that's number one, we want legislation that works for us. Number two, once the legislation is passed, we wanna make sure that our minority businesses actually get a cut from that. There's all, there was, the CARES Act package was $2.2 trillion. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> that's a lot of money. So oh, we, need to, we need to link those opportunities with our businesses and I'm telling you, I was in federal government for a long time, three years, seemed like 30. And it is hard finding out how to apply, who to apply to, the grant writing process is not friendly. So I'm gonna take that knowledge that I spent three years at EDA and at MBDA um, and working across all the departments and help um, our businesses actually get some of these federal grants. I'm glad you had Sharon Pinder on because I'm going to be working with her on the procurement stuff and making sure we get these contracts. Excellent, excellent. I think, you know, a lot of folks are wondering now because you, you made such an impact in just the, the, the short time that you're with MBDA. Is there anything that we should anticipate that would maybe coming now that you're on the other side that we can think of how we can even work more closely with MBDA and what we should expect? Um, with MBDA? Yeah, just in general. So I so some I have to be very careful what I say about this, yeah, but, I, yeah. but I will say the two, um, three the three projects I think that I really was proud of at MBDA was the Enterprising Women of Color program. I think it is super important that we take care of our enterprising women of color. They face unique barriers, whether it be getting funding, whether it be you know marketing opportunities, whatever it is. So we carved out something for that. I also think it's very important uh, the stuff that Amazon business is doing, right? Now's the time to really, you know, leverage their services, which are free. They're holding webinars all across the country to really, you know, do more um, sales online. And the third one that I'm, I'm really proud of is the equity fund. Um, we've seen all the data. There's $74 trillion of assets under management. 1.3% of that is in the hands of diverse asset managers. 1.3% of 71 trillion. So we want to do, I'm, I want to do a couple of things. Number one, I want to increase the number of diverse asset managers. We just need more of them. Number two, we want to create a fund because when you look at the assets, whether it be passive assets or active assets, um, really scale is key. And you really see it in the hands of about three or four of the industry giants, and it's really hard creating these funds or even doing anything with them. So we want to, I guess you call it, pool our money together mm -hmm. so that we can have bigger impact and we can really start developing these minority businesses. Excellent. Now, is there any particular part of industry, and I've heard you say this before, the, the third industrial revolution or something along those lines, is there an area that you think that our MBEs really should be focused on that we are not leveraging today that we should be putting more emphasis on? I, 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 I'm, I'm, a tech, I'm a tech junkie and I cannot stress as much. I mean, this future work stuff, if you didn't believe in it then, you should know now. If, if you're not a digital business or if you're not trending towards being a digital business, you're gonna have a very hard time of growing in the economy. Um, but, but the, key, the key is really, um, number one, knowing what market you're in, and number two, just leveraging networks. I, I really think it's very, very important that we work together on this. I've seen some companies try to go alone and try to compete with the, you know, 
the Facebooks, the Microsofts. To me, the best strategy is to, if you're just getting into this, is to start super small, right? And leverage stuff, proven mature tech like e-commerce, web optimization. And then you can start looking into artificial intelligence. You can start looking into blockchain, virtual reality, augmented reality, some of those things to grow to scale. Um, but I really, really think it's important just to start somewhere. We get freaked out and people think that they go from nothing to like quantum computing. <laughs> that, that, that's just not what it is. That's just not the game. That's not what it is. Start small, build some capabilities. And when you do hire, and, and another thing, when you do hire contractors, I know a lot of our uh, minority businesses are hiring some people, make sure that if you hire one of these tech companies that they actually build a capability in-house. You don't want to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on people coming in and giving you two years of their tech and then when they're gone, you have nothing left. So make sure that they're building some in-house capabilities while you're paying them their lofty sums. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you, Henry. I, again, just as for me, as the president of NMSDC, I am super thrilled about our, our, our working together, knowing that we're gonna accomplish the big things and making sure that our MBEs, again, are not just lost or diluted in this whole recovery piece. We know there's a lot of money out there that's available. As you said, you talk about $2 trillion, mm -hmm. <laughs> we're going to make sure that our MPEs get a piece of that. So thank you so much. And thank you for jumping on and just kind of sharing your vision. And everybody, you will be seeing much more of Henry coming up because we're going to get some things accomplished and making sure we're working together to make sure we're positioning our minority businesses to be sustained through this pandemic. So thank you, Henry. Thank you. All righty. Okay. So next, I'm going to ask uh, Maria Prince, who's on online. She's our vice president of the NMSDC Academy. As Henry mentioned, we really do have to think of how we now pivot. This whole pandemic has changed the way we do business. And if people are thinking that we're going to go back to what was known as a normal, that's not the case. What we do know is that we're going to have to learn how to do business differently. And what we learned is that when we started focusing on our leadership series, our leadership week that we had in place, that that was going to have to be different. We're going to have to deliver it differently. So we have turned that into a whole virtual experience. And as, as Henry mentioned, there are some partnerships with the Minority Business Development Agency around their Enterprising Women of Color initiative that Maria Prince under the NMSDC Academy has been working on to make sure that we can deliver a, a new fresh product to you in the virtual world. So Maria, do you want to talk to the audience about what we're doing to reshape our leadership week into a leadership series? Well, thank you, Adrian. I'm very excited to do that. And you're right. We had to take what we were doing for Leadership Week in New York. It's an event that everybody has enjoyed for many, many years. We would get together in New York. We would have some great networking, some great sessions. We'd have an, a gala, awards gala, recognizing all the great work being done around the network. But now we had to pivot, just like many of you, to a more virtual world. And how do we take that great event and do the same caliber of quality of an event in the virtual world. So I'm gonna to talk to you about some of the things that we're doing. Uh, first of all, we are partnering with MBDA. One of the things that we wanted to do when we first did the uh, network, the Leadership Week in New York, is we were planning to partner with MBDA and their enterprising women of color. And we thought that was such a powerful, valuable partnership with them. We decided to pivot that to a virtual world. So one of the first things that you'll see coming out of that Women of Color event is starting on May 13th, and you'll get this detail, uh, it's coming soon, but May 13th, we have an exciting event coming about access to capital. We have one of the most powerful women in the capital markets in Carla Harris, and I don't know how many of you know Carla, but she is a powerhouse. She has been, she is one of the, she is the vice chairman of Morgan Stanley, She's been in the capital markets. She's been working across many different industries. And she was Barack Obama's chair for the National Women Business Council. So if anybody can talk about and talk to women about capital markets and, and access to capital, she can. And she's going to be joined by two other more powerful, two other powerful women and Monica Mantilla, who spent 20 years of her career. And she's very passionate about helping women get access to, to uh, capital and Carmen uh, Ortiz McGee, who is the executive vice president of the National Association of Investment Companies. So those three women will be kicking off our Women of Color series, talking about how you can access capital, what kind of capital should you access, how do you leverage it, 
and how do you manage your capital, especially in these trying times. Uh, that's going to be followed by a fireside chat with a uh, founder, Lisa Price, of uh, Carol's daughter. So she's going to talk about her journey. She grew a business and it recently sold that business for millions of dollars in a very competitive health environment. And so she's going to be talk taking you guys through what she did to grow that business and ultimately was able to sell that business to L'Oreal. Following that, we're going to have a panel of women from our network who have in various sizes from uh, startups to those that are growing very fast to those that have been very successful. And they're gonna take you through their journey. How did they get to where they are? What, have, what are the tips and advice they can give all of you out there that are trying to grow your business? And how are they pivoting in the new COVID-19 world? And so we're very excited to have them. And then we're gonna wrap up the Women of Color series with something that we all need to remember as women. How do we take care of our mental, emotional, physical self as we're doing all these things? You know, as women, we tend to forget about that. We're business owners, we're mothers, we're grandmothers, we're aunts, and we always take care of everyone else. But this session will be all about how do you take care of yourself, run your business, and do all the things that you have to do in your daily life. And so that will be uh, the end of our four-week session. It will start on May 13th, and it will wrap up on June 3rd. Excellent. Thank you, Maria. And we are just so excited to be able to bring this, this fresh content in a virtual world to our, our constituents. So um, thank you for the work that the NMSDC Academy has done. Thank you for the work of our programming team that has really helped us to pivot and think of how we can continue to deliver content in this virtual uh, atmosphere that we're working in now. And hopefully everyone will see that it's, you know, even though we can't be together physically, we can still make sure we're using technology to connect and share information that's going to be uh, critical and important for our constituents so that, again, they can continue to learn, grow, and have those connections made. I would like to mention one other thing. Uh, in addition to the Women of Color events that we're having, uh, we are also having some additional events through the month of May. So starting May 21st, we're going to have Chris Gardner, and I don't know how many of you know Chris Gardner, but he was the topic of the Pursuit of Happiness movie. He's a successful businessman, entrepreneur, philanthropist, and he's going to be speaking to us on May 21st. He's going to be our initial keynote speaker. So we think you all will benefit from his motivational message. If anyone can talk about overcoming adversity, he can. And that'll be followed by some specialized sessions for our um, Corporate Plus and our CPOs. We've got some great sessions for them to talk about how are they recovering in the COVID-19 world. And that'll be followed by some unique sessions for our supplier diversity professionals, for our MBEs. And we will close that session with a virtual gala. We've got some exciting things coming. Uh, we've got some creative things coming to make that very fun and very engaging for everyone that chooses to join. So be on the lookout for all of the information, communication that we'll be sending you about that awards gala that will be held virtually. So with that, Adrian, I'm gonna hand it back over to you. Great, thank you, Maria. And before you go, um, there is a question that has come up from the audience and I think it's important that we do address it because I've heard this question before and that is, are there any opportunities for uh, men that we are creating as, that are specific such as that we have for women of color? Are there any particular programs for minority men? Minority men are certainly welcome to join the Women of Color session. We're not excluding you by any means. But specific to minority men, uh, all of the other sessions that we're having during that month will include minority men. Um, you will be uh, enriched. You'll find those sessions very rewarding. They're not specifically to men, but um, all of the other sessions will include uh, minority men in them. Thank you. And I think that's one thing that we do want to make sure we clarify. It's not that we are uh, excluding men, but we have recognized that women of color is an emerging market. It is an emerging demographic of entrepreneurship. It's one of the, it's the fastest growing segment of entrepreneurship. So we want to make sure that we are providing uh, support, infrastructure, and guidance for those businesses that have traditionally not been included as part of the economic inclusion strategy. So it's not that we're excluding our men, but we're just finding a way to make sure we're bringing our women along with us. I think it would be good for us to kind of do a recap of some of the initiatives that we've put in place so far 
because this COVID-19 has been a, 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 a learning opportunity for us, an experience for us to really figure out ways that we can better support our entire network. So Don, I'm going to ask you to speak to the COVID-19 resource page that we've been able to create to put all of our information into one page, one-stop resource for all of our constituents to understand what's going on with COVID-19. Thank you, Adrian. So um, as mentioned earlier, we have nmsdc.org forward slash town hall that is available. Uh, this session today is being recorded and will be available there uh, within 48 hours, business hours, so essentially uh, on Monday. And all of the sessions that have taken place thus far can also be found there. Um, so yes, nmsdc.org org forward slash town hall. We also want to make sure that you visit nmsdccares.org. Um, that is also our COVID-19 resource page. Um, so you're welcome to go there to find various information. As we have these sessions, we, we upload um, URLs for the various websites um, that are discussed during this session. Um, and also, uh, we will post it in the chat um, uh, one, uh, a few more times, but if you have not completed the survey that Adrian mentioned earlier, the MBE COVID-19 Economic Impact Survey, uh, so that we can gather all of the information about how this epidemic is, is, is impacting our MBEs. So that information will be shared in the chat. No, thank you so much. Thank you, Don. I think that's so important that Everyone understands that we recognize that you're getting a lot of information from a lot of different sources. And after we convened our COVID-19 task force, which is comprised of council presidents, corporate members, our MBE leaders, what they said to us is, can you put all this in one place so that we know where to go to get information, whether that's from an affiliate council, whether that's from an outside source or strategic partner that NMSDC is working with. We wanted to make sure that we had the ability to bring all of that together in one page. So, Again, that site is nmsdccares.org. It is where you can have, we have a repository of all of our information that's COVID-19 related. So that have, if you have any questions on funding, resources, financial assistance, uh, operational information, it's all located there for you to be able to access in one place. All right, and, uh, is that it? Okay, great, thank you. Thank you for pulling it up. So this has been helpful for those and we've gotten great feedback where you can understand different information that's available for you to be able to leverage. It's where you, if you've pivoted your business and you're now able to provide COVID-19 related uh, products and services, you can input the information into this website and our corporate members can uh, understand who is available to be able to support them. Um, and again, just different um, information resources that you can tap into that may be helpful for you. And it's where you can also download all of our webinars and other information that we provided related to COVID-19. Um, there were some questions that came through, uh, through the chat that I'll go ahead and answer. So one of the questions that came up was, will this town hall be available for uh, viewers later? And the answer again is yes. You can, you can go back and review all of our town hall uh, virtual sessions on our NMSDC uh, .org webpage or also on our nmsccares.org webpage where we have all of our COVID-related information. Uh, other questions that have, that have come up and been answered is how can we get access to the survey for minority businesses? Will it be emailed to you? I see it's been emailed from the national office to you directly. It should have been emailed to you from your regional council and it's available on the nmsccares.org uh, nmsdc webpage. It's really important that you access that, that survey and take the survey because, again, there are a number of federal agencies that are asking us for this information because they want to understand how they can be of help to our, our MBEs. And the data, I can't tell you how many different sources have come to us almost daily wanting to know what percentage of our MBEs have been funded, what challenges are they having, how can, how can we get them the, the needed support and all of that information is really critical, which is why we're gathering it in the, um, in the um, survey so that you can have it. So um, anyway, those are, those are things that we think will be very helpful for you. Please, if you have not done so, take advantage of the survey because it's gonna be really helpful for you and helpful for us to be able to get the resources that you need. Uh, other question that was asked is we were talking about the Enterprising Women of Color Initiative 
The question is, does women of color include Asians? And as uh, everyone should know, NMSDC is, a, is an ethnic minority organization and does cover uh, all ethnicities of African-American, Hispanic American, Native American, and Asian American. So yes, indeed, Asian women are included in women of color. Um, and that may be good, Maria. I think something that may be helpful is for people to understand exactly a little bit more detail around some of those sessions. So can you talk just a little bit more specifically about what we're planning to cover in those enterprise, enterprise women of color sessions, what, what they can anticipate could be helpful for them? Sure, Adrian. I'd love to do that. So under leveraging access to capital to support business growth, uh, we're going to, uh, Carla Harris, as I spoke about, who is a powerhouse in the capital markets, she's going to provide an overview around the strategies that you can employ around capital, how to manage it, how to get it, how to keep it, more importantly. And then after she speaks, then we're going to have um, the women I mentioned earlier, Monica and Carmen, talk specifically about each stage in the capital markets. When do you use each stage in the capital market, depending on the growth of your business, the stage your business is in, and really give you some tools and some tips to understand when's the right time to access the right capital. So that'll be a very informative, detailed session. I, I would encourage everybody to come, take notes. You might even want to review the recording afterwards because it'll be very specific about how you access and you utilize capital to grow your business. The fireside chat with Lisa Price, that is going to be her taking you through her journey. And she's unique in that she started small and she grew a business and then she sold the business, which is a lot of us who have been entrepreneurs, that's kind of the ultimate dream sometimes is that you grow a business to the point that you can actually sell it and um, maybe start another business for those of you that are serial entrepreneurs. But so she's going to be able to take you from startup to sale to a large corporation in a very competitive market. Beauty and healthcare, as we all know, is very competitive. And there's not many uh, minority entrepreneurs and not many women in that industry, although women are the main consumer of healthcare and beauty. Creating and growth and success strategies for your comeback. Here's all about, again, we're going to have women who are in startup. We're going to have women who are kind of the middle. We're going to have women who have grown their business to these huge, uh, uh, large multinational firms. And they're going to talk to you from their vantage point of what you can do to grow and maintain your business. They're going to talk specifically about how do you do that in this environment and how do you look for ways to pivot your business into something different? Because we know that may be something we all have to think about is what your business was before COVID-19 may not be the business that you see coming out of it. And so how do you recognize those opportunities and how they recognize those opportunities? Because many of these women have been through the economic downturn, uh, they've been through market crashes, they've been through a lot of things that they've had to pull through and still maintain their business. So they're gonna be able to talk to you specifically about that. It will be a Q and A session, all of these, you'll have an opportunity to answer questions, uh, you'll have an opportunity to, again, look at the video recording later on our webpage that Adrian showed early, late, uh, she showed earlier, but it's going to be really important for you to, to join these sessions because there there's a lot of meat. It's not going to be a lot of talk. And finally, and more importantly, I think the mental, emotional, and physical comeback um, that we all kind of need. I know some of you probably, as you're working from home or working uh, remotely, have to remind yourselves to get up and go outside and relax and take care of yourself first. So we're gonna have a very powerful speaker. I don't wanna give it away yet, but it is a talent that we're working uh, with Essence to get an MBDA, but we're gonna take you through how do you maintain yourself, your, your mental capacity. Many of you, you know, have kids at home and you're juggling all these things and trying to work at the same time and trying to maintain your business. How do you do that in this environment and still be okay and still be, you know, calm and still have some time to relax and take care of yourself? So those are the sessions. We feel like there's something for everyone. Uh, it'll take you through a journey from capital to growing your business to hearing from women who have done it to finally, you know, how do you survive and how do you maintain your, uh, your sanity? Uh, as you're going through all of that. So Adrian, uh, we're very pleased. We, we're, we're so pleased to be partnering with uh, MBDA on this. I, I'm glad that Henry uh, Childs has joined. He was the, you know, the, the think tank of enterprising women of color. And we're just glad that we're able to partner with this team, even though he's 
he's not there anymore, but we're still partnering with his team and, and moving this forward. Thank you, Maria. And again, I think it's uh, really important to, for our audience to know that as we made the shift from Leadership Week to Leadership Series, there will be other things other than just the focus on enterprising women of color. We still have sessions for our corporate members. We still have se sessions for our, our corporate plus and for our, our CPOs. Can you talk just a little bit about what leadership series will look like in its totality? Are you on mute, Maria? Still on mute. Okay. Can there you, you hear go. Yes, yeah. we can. Okay. So that isn't a very important point because what people have come to love about Leadership Week that it just wasn't about going to the gala. Well, although the gala was fun and important, we all love dressing mm -hmm. up and we love, you know, handing out the awards and recognizing people who do great work in this space. But we also had some really meaningful sessions that were going on around the city. And I have to say, my heart goes out to New York City and everything that you guys are going through there. That is where our headquarters is located. So uh, really miss uh, getting into New York and, and we feel for you guys that are, that are living there. So we hope you're staying safe and healthy. But one of the key things about New York was that, you know, we were able to network. We were able to share best practices. We had uh, things for MBEs. We had sessions for our corporate members. Um, we had specific sessions for our CPOs. We had specific sessions for our corporate plus members. Our corporate plus members are really the, the largest some of the largest MBEs we have in our network, um, they've been sponsored in by other corporations. They have proven over time that they can handle large contracts, they can handle complex contracts. And so we do a specific session for them with the CPOs talking about issues, you know, that those large corporations may face, um, not only in this pandemic, but, but getting out of it. And so we're very pleased to be offering up some research that we've been partnering with on some of the best practices that other corporations and other MBEs have done. And we're gonna have some breakout sessions talking about those best practices. And we're gonna have opportunities for them to share with each other what they've been doing and with an outcome of here are some things that you can do to pivot your supply chains into post COVID-19. And here are some things that other corporations are doing that you can learn from. So we're very, very excited about that. And one of the things we're gonna be doing is we've, tap some of the, the best economic advisors in the country. Uh, we're gonna have a panel of them on the first day of that session, which is May 19th. And they're gonna talk about the economy, what they're seeing, what are the markets doing? Uh, what should these large uh, businesses be thinking about? You'll be able to ask some questions. So that's gonna be a rich topic as well. Hearing from economic advisors who study this and who've been living this and who are tapped to understand how is the economy gonna look coming out of COVID-19. And then finally, you know, we have some smaller group sessions. Everyone's in, invited to attend them, but we're going to be specifically talking to our MBEs. And I believe corporations can benefit around how do you risk mitigate all the things you have to think about during COVID-19 and afterwards. Operationally, how do you ramp back up when the economy opens up again? How do you think about your associates? How do you protect them? How do you make sure you have the right policies in place for associates coming back to work. IT, how do you make sure that you can work remotely? If those of you that are working remotely, how do you make sure you have the equipment, the, the infrastructure in place to work remotely? How do you have policies around how associates work remotely? And insurance risk, I mean, how do you protect yourselves? Because I can only imagine coming out of this, there's probably gonna be a lot of new things in insurance agreements around pandemics and what happens in a pandemic and what do you do and what's covered and what's not covered. So we're going to have someone from the insurance industry talking about how do you think about that. So it's going to be a very comprehensive look of what do businesses need to think about coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic and all of those different areas. Following that, we're going to have uh, specific things around supplier diversity professionals because they're, they're going to have to think differently as well. And so we've got sessions on how to think differently about how you develop your suppliers, uh, how do you uh, manage your second tier and what we call directed tier? How do you make sure that you give more MBEs more opportunity to share in the supply chain as the advocates of your corporations and making sure that minority businesses get opportunities? We're going to have a session for them because budgets are being cut and it's getting tough to get dollars sometimes to fund diversity inclusion supplier diversity programs. And so we're going to go through a session with those professionals and everyone's invited 
but we're going to walk through a methodology of how do you justify, how do you build an ROI, how do you think about all the costs and the benefit levers that you need to consider when you're building your business case for supplier diversity within your corporations. That will probably be one of the most beneficial sessions for a supplier diversity professional at this time because they're all facing budget cuts. And so this gives them tools to go back to their organizations and show the true value of minority businesses. And Adrian, as you all often say, minority business matters. This is how they can put pen to paper, numbers, because numbers don't lie. Numbers are very powerful. And how do they do that in a way that they can support uh, the business case to keep those, those departments funded? And then finally, our keynote, very excited about that. We are determined to make this fun. We're determined not to make this, you know, you, you sign up for the webinar and we give awards and everyone says thank you. You know, we want to have music. We want to have people engaged. We want to make sure that the, the uh, award winners feel special. And so we're really trying to think outside the box on how we make that a very exciting session for everyone and be fun. And, and even if you're sheltered in place in your home, how do we make it fun for you as you're joining us for that award ceremony since we all can't be together in person like we have been in New York. And so I think you'll be pleased with what we do with that gala uh, closing out the session and we'll have a really exciting speaker as well. So Adrian, uh, as you can tell, I'm excited. My team's excited. We're all excited about what we're gonna be offering. Even though we're not in New York, we feel like you know it might be as good or as exciting as being in New York, but we're determined to, to make these sessions very informative, engaging, and beneficial to everyone that joins. Excellent, thank you, Maria. And again, everyone stay tuned because we will be sending out information uh, very soon so that you can see all of this in its totality and get registered for it and get it on your calendars because we wanna make sure again, that we don't lose the ability to connect even if it's virtually. So thank you, Maria, for that. And thank you for so quickly working with the programming committee at NMSDC to reposition the content so that we can still deliver it. All right, so our special guest has joined us today. Thank you so much, Congresswoman Joyce Beatty. Uh, let me please make sure I give the proper introduction to you. Um, Congresswoman Beatty is a native Ohioan, along with yours truly, uh, and is also a strong history of connect, have a strong history of connecting people, policy, and politics to make a difference. Since 2013, Congresswoman Beatty has proudly represented Ohio's third congressional district. Uh, Congresswoman Beatty serves on the exclusive House Committee on Financial Services and is a member of two subcommittees, Housing and Insurance and Oversight and Investigations. The Financial Services Committee oversees the entire financial services industry, including the nation's banking, securities, insurance, and housing industries, as well as the work of the Federal Reserve, the United States Department of Treasury, and the United States Securities and Exchange Commission. Prior to her service in the U.S. House of Representatives, Congresswoman Beatty was Senior Vice President of Outreach and Engagement at the Ohio State University and a member in the Ohio House of Representatives for five terms. During her tenure in the Ohio House, she rose to become the first female Democratic House leader in Ohio's history and was instrumental in spearheading and enacting legislation to require financial literacy in Ohio's public school curriculum to expand STEM education and to secure funds to help under and uninsured women access breast and cervical cancer treatment. In 2014, Congresswoman mm -hmm. Beatty's efforts proved pivotal, pivotal in securing nearly 4 million in federal funds to address Columbus's infant mortality rate, which is one of the highest in the country. In the same year, she also brought then Department of Head, House and Urban Development, HUD, Secretary Sean Donovan to the 3rd Congressional District to announce a $225 million project to revitalize the Near East Side, led by nearly $30 million in federal funds. She is a sought-out public speaker and a recipient of numerous awards. She was previously named one of Ebony Magazine's 150 Most Powerful African Americans in the United States. Congresswoman Beatty is an active, link, uh, active member of the Lynx Incorporated, along with yours truly. Uh, she is a proud member of Delta Sigma Theta Incorporated, National Coalition of 100 Black Women, as yours truly is as well, the Columbus Urban League, the American Heart Association, where she previously served on the board and numerous other organizations. She received her Bachelor of Arts from Central State University and her Master of Science from Wright State University and completed all requirements 
but her dissertation for a doctorate at the University of Cincinnati. And in addition, she has been awarded honorary doctorate degrees from Ohio Dominican University and Central State University. Congresswoman Beatty is married to attorney Otto Beatty Jr. and she is the, the proud grandmother of two toddlers, toddlers who lovingly call her Grammy. So I wanted to make sure that people understood the breadth and depth of all that you have done over the years to really champion for the people, not just in the state of Ohio, but all across this country and the, the work and the impact that you've had as a member of Congress. So we thank you so much for your service, your leadership and your time and commitment. So I thought I would just turn it over to you to give us a few opening words before we jump right into the Q&A. Okay, well, first of all, uh, let me just say thank you to you, not only for that most gracious introduction, but for all the leadership and the work and everything that you are doing in your role with the National Minority Supplier Development Council. And most of all, for allowing me to be here today to hopefully bring a message that will be engaging and will help us continue to move forward with a direct emphasis on all of those businesses that you advocate for and that I fight for. But first, I'd like to take a, a point of personal uh, privilege because something uh, happened today that puts it in perspective uh, for me. Uh, I've been a long time admirer of your work, uh, not only where you are now, but your previous work, and, and also of the organization. Uh, I go back many decades with following uh, the work of this organization. And as I was going through some files today, 30 years ago, my brother was on the board there, and he came to the U.S. Congress and spoke before the small uh, business committee, uh, Ralph Birdsong. And when he spoke there, he talked about the general economy and its effect on the minority business enterprise. Now, why is that significant, Adrian? Because 30 years later, I'm in the U.S. Congress. I'm chairing a subcommittee on the Financial Services Committee, putting emphasis on diversity and inclusion. That's not the significant point. The significant point is Adrian Tremble comes in and testifies before the United States Congress as a Black woman leading an organization fighting for African Americans and other minority businesses and was so provocative as you talked about good for the bottom line. Think about that. Good for the bottom line for the business case for diversity and inclusion. And then here we are today talking about the coronavirus and this pandemic crises that we're in. And you and I are here talking about how we can speak to the nation and be able to hopefully lend some education and awareness, some advocacy, and to use your terms that I have heard you say, asking us to lean in. So today I'm gonna to ask people to lean in with me. And if you don't mind, I'll take a few moments and just kind of walk through you and the audience and all those who are in a leadership role on the call and all of those who are listening to the call. Uh, I won't go into a, a great deal of, of detail, but I will talk about how we got to where we are today very uh, briefly because I think it's important for the audience to know that I will talk about the first of three bills. When we first started with this, it was the Corona Preparedness and Response Supplemental Appropriation Act. And it had $8.3 billion that was put in there primarily to fund for all of the healthcare issues that we talk about in response to public health, the things that the doctors and the scientists had alerted us about. The second bill, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. Very important because it made coronavirus testing free. It talked about the paid family leave. It talked about the caretakers leave and all of those things. It talked about SNAP and food service needs for the least of us. But most importantly then, we were saying testing, testing, testing. Fast forwarding today, we know the value 
of testing. When we look at the number of people who have been tested to be positive, but more importantly, when we look at the disparities and how disproportionately African Americans and other minorities uh, are, how they're affected by that, and how that parallels with small businesses. And when we're talking about businesses being the economic drivers, that takes us to the third piece of legislation, the CARES Act, which made an unprecedented uh, allocation of monies, more than we've ever done in this Congress, $2 trillion to go back out into our communities for workers, for small businesses, for not-for-profits in churches, for the healthcare uh, system to be able to hopefully stay in business. Now, where are we today when we talk about this epidemic, when we talk about minority businesses? Well, let me start with COVID-19 pandemic has certainly amplified the polarization of minority businesses in comparison to their white peers being able to access the funds to support entrepreneurship. We also know that when we look at the numbers, so important, I've followed you putting data and statistics up all on your website. We have done the same on our website and certainly being a proud member and vice chairman of the Congressional Black Caucus. Why do we do that? Because it's important for us to understand where we are in the dynamics to help us better understand how we are and will be affected by the dynamics. And it also sends a message back to people like me, who maybe don't look like me, the people in Congress. So when I'm fighting and, and I am regurgitating your data and your information, I want them to know how real and how serious this is. And if we were already disproportionately affected when we were in the normal, now think about how much we fall back at where we are now, and we don't even know exactly what the new normal is going to be. But what we do know is it will affect minority businesses. So it is undisputed that minority businesses are the key drivers to the economy. We also know that in order for us to sustain minority businesses, we will need to rely on funding. And that gets us to where we are today when we talk about how many times we have voted, how many times we have sent the messages across the country that we need to be included in this legislation. And here's what I mean about that. We know the first financial allocation for COVID-19 was $349 billion that we put in there for small businesses. Sounded wonderful when we first heard it. What did we learn? 10 days or so after the dollars were put in the hopper to go out, the dollars were exhausted minority businesses and small businesses. And let's not talk about independent contractors and, and 1099 employees and sole proprietors. They weren't even in the queue. Many of them had not even realized what was happening and what was available. So what do we do? We learn a little bit from our mistakes. Adrian, I can tell you, I went on the US House floor for the second allocation when they announced we were gonna put another 310 billion in. And I considered it to be the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good dollars were there. The bad, still far too many minority businesses and small businesses were not going to be in the process. And the ugly, it would not be enough money. And as we have heard, small businesses might be able to have a reserve. Some will say for 15 days, others will say for up to almost a month or 27 days. Well, we know if we look at the whole United States and our population that most people don't have an extra $400 to get them through. So when you look at 40% or 60% of the population can't do that, 
we decided, okay, $310 billion for us to put in for small businesses. So then we thought we would take $60 billion and reserve it for community financial institutions. And then we would take another uh, pot of monies and explicitly say that it's for MDIs, minority depository institutions. And then we would do CDFIs. And while that all sounded great, if you look at the great state of Ohio, where I am, 11 million people, we don't have MDIs. And the assumption was, if you had a minority depository institution, then minority businesses, African-American businesses would gravitate to that MDI or that CDIF. Not necessarily so. When you look at the charts, many of us go to our hometown bank. Many of us go to where we had banked personally or where our mentor referred us to or what's in close proximity to your business. So we then realized, or especially me, while I support full-heartedly the MDIs, it gave me pause that we did not write anything specifically into the legislation to talk about African-American or minority businesses and where was the carve out for them. We carved out dollars for not-for-profits. I'm all for that. We carved out pro uh, dollars for churches that meet the 501c3. I'm all for that. So I decided we needed to look at what we could do to carve out for minority businesses without making the assumptions that they had to be directed to an MDI. Very much like we did in healthcare. The second time around, we put another $100 billion in for hospitals and healthcare. Fully support that. But what we realized is we needed to break those dollars out and have healthcare dollars, but also we needed dollars for testing. Because when you talk about minorities and specifically African-Americans, here we go again. We know that there are disparities there. When we look at the nation and Ohio parallels that, we make up 13% of the 11 million people in the great state of Ohio. But when we look at the coronavirus and we look at those who have contracted it, tested positive, we make up 23.3% of that. When we look at the death rate in Ohio and right here in my community, keep in mind, 13% of the population, 12 to 13% of the death rate. There's something wrong with that, with those statistics. And we'll find the same thing to be true with we are unbanked and underbanked. We also know we don't oftentimes know or even have a primary physician that we can go to to say, I think I feel sick and will you please give me the test so I could find out you know, if uh, I uh, have the virus or not. So all of those things are, are so complicated, but they are also all the things that are so important to small businesses. We also realize that we did not have enough safeguards into the business. You know, uh, I am sure you were like I was when you open up the New York Times or you're looking at the newspaper and you see a restaurant has not only received the maximum 10 million, but twice, they have 20 million. And, and we have small businesses, if they could get 100000 or $50,000 to help sustain their payroll and stay in business. Well, there was some good uh, about that. With our leader, Speaker Pelosi, coming out and saying, we're going to put safeguards in. We are going to appoint oversight committees. We got a lot of pushback at first, but she has put in place and named seven people to serve on a committee that will have the oversight and investigation of the safeguards. Uh, I think that was even more evident that it was needed when we had restaurants like Ruth Chris and when we had Shake Shack and others not only getting it, but deciding that maybe this doesn't look uh, as uh, well as we thought it would, so they have returned their dollars. And then lastly, you should be holding us accountable and asking us, just as we ask you, 
what are we doing about this? So I'm very pleased between my role as vice chair and the Congressional Black Caucus, we put together a very aggressive platform, standing up, making recommendations, endorsing that dollars would go to the entire $3 billion would go to the Minority Development agency. Uh, we know we didn't get all of those funds. I can tell you I also have dropped uh, a bill and in introduced a piece of legislation called the MORE, capital M-O-R-E, Act, and that's making opportunities a reality for entrepreneurs. Now, what's so good about that, we target those minority and small businesses with 25 and less employees. We also have put in there, if you cannot uh, show or indicate that you have had a 20% reduction based on the COVID-19. In other words, you have to have the need. So many of the larger companies, they have months and months of reserves, but when you open it up, you know, I can't be upset that people applied when you just put it out there. And then uh, no pub, um, privately traded companies could get it. And then lastly, we put a discrimination clause in there. Why would someone say I would want to do that? Because here is what we found out. We found out we allocated the dollars and maybe if proportionately they had been allocated, it might have been enough between the two allocations. But what happened is banks then said, if you don't have a relationship with me, I'm not lending you dollars. Let's take that a step further. Let's define that relationship. I know for a fact, because of the plethora of information and people who have contacted me and said, I had a relationship with this bank, a good relationship. They also said I had had a loan with this bank, but I'm a small minority business. They not only didn't get the loan, they weren't even in the queue. Many didn't even get a loan number. So we wanted to define in that discriminatory clause that we wanted to make sure you could not do this again as we continue to fund. And lastly, ban the box. What was very appalling to me was when you look at what I'm going to call double jeopardy in the bill. Let's just say that I had been incarcerated, served my time, got um, out of uh, jail, prison five years ago took my training and skills from being a stellar inmate and opened up a business, barbershop. Let's say I now have 10, 20 chairs in my barbershop. It's been thriving for the last four years. I've paid every uh, bill. Everything has been perfect. Now I apply for the PPP. But because I had been incarcerated and had a felony, I'm not eligible, even though I met all of the capacities of the lending institution. Even more appalling to me, let's say I have a perfect record and I pick you and three other people to be my partners in it. And I hire uh, a lawyer to oversee and look at everything. And then this lawyer is having some difficulties for maybe something with his trust account or something he didn't do. And he's now in the justice system. But let's say the bar didn't think in uh, comparison to his years of service that it was something that they would want to uh, indict him on. So they sent him to a diversion program. I would then not be eligible because even including being in a diversion program or being indicted, uh, not yet receiving your sentence, you're ineligible for it. So we know that's just a, another unnecessary hurdle. So I had been working on legislation with Congressman Joe, Joe Kennedy uh, on something very similar. And so we have now introduced it as it relates to the COVID-19. Certainly I could go on and on and tell you uh, more uh, about the paycheck, but I know we have 
individuals or you have questions that you might want to ask. So if we want to move to that, I can certainly incorporate uh, some of my comments within my responses to the questions. No, thank you so much. You, you gave us a lot there. Um, and I'm just sitting here because I'm just jumping at the bit to kind of unpack some of it and ask some of the, the specific questions. Um, one of the things I think is so important that I want our audience to hear, and I've heard this question over and over, and you've alluded to it, and that is when, this, when these funds were first released, the first round, they were gone within 10 days. Mm -hmm. And the, all of our, we had folks who came on our, our webcast and told our members, go to your bank, go to the bank that you already have a relationship with. And to your point, many of those who did go to their own banks, when we did the survey the first time around, over 52% never even heard a response. They never even got anybody to, to, to respond back to them at all. Um, one of the things we're trying to understand is, you know, then the round two came out, and although the response rate was higher, now we're seeing even over 60% that still have not received funds. So there's still a, a problem with these smaller minority companies being able to access the funds. What would you say as being a member of the powerful House Committee on Financial Services, your thoughts around how the banks have handled their response to this and how are they going to be held accountable going forward? Because one thing is, even as I've tried to work with some of them, you know, they, their hands are somewhat tied. They can't even ask about race or ethnicity as part of their funding process. So they can't tell you who is or who isn't getting loans as it relates to race. But guess what? We can. We can tell you who is and who isn't. And we see the data. So I'm just thinking, how do we get more accountability for those banks? Uh, I'm, glad, I'm glad that you asked that question because certainly that's something that we are hearing and witnessing uh, across the country. So unfortunately, you, you can't write historic legislation on just uh, a month or a few weeks of uh, being able to uh, asset, uh, assess all of the unintentional consequences. But with that, we should have been better prepared at all levels, because we already knew uh, the disparities in how uh, we are treated. We've seen that with you coming before the committee. But with that said, I think the oversight that we have uh, is uh, one thing that we're looking at as we look back now over what has happened. We are asking for data now, very much like you. We are making it very uh, public with healthcare and with the economic impact as it relates to uh, small businesses. We have bicameral, bipartisanship, uh, looking at how do we force the hand of the local banks and the national banks. And I know we can do this serving on the Financial Services Committee. When Congresswoman Maxine Waters said, we are going to ask for this data on DNI. We wanted to know how many people or who did you have making the decisions. And we're talking about the nine largest banks in the country coming before our committee. We also wanted to know how many people were on their boards. And so when we got that data, it did reveal the alarming statistics that we thought we were going to get because we already knew. So I think we are looking at it in that same vein, we need the data, but we also needed to be better prepared. We needed to be better prepared through the SBA. We needed to be better prepared through the unemployment because it, it's a two-headed. I am a small business owner, but I have employees. And so while I'm trying to take care of all of my insurances, all of my payroll, I also have an obligation to those individuals who work for me to make sure that they are getting their stimulus impact checks, the $1,200 that were going out, the $500, a lot of dispute on that, whether the age was 17 or 16, means some people didn't even know. And then finally, through education and awareness and websites, we were able to educate most people of the 1200 in the uh, financial requirements for that in the 500. Then there was the whole unemployment issue that small businesses for the first time, independent contractors were able to apply for unemployment, which was an amazing good in the good, the bad and the ugly. But here comes the bad and the ugly. The employment offices across the country 
weren't geared up and ready. So while we had put in the legislation that they wouldn't even have the traditional 10-day wait period, it ended up being a wait period anyway because they could not handle the capacity. They were doing more in one month or 20 days than they did in a year. So the process shut down, the systems crashed. So we should have had a better staging of when you could come and report. If you tell me that I'm in the first two weeks, I can accept that if I know I'm in the third and fourth, but if you open it up and, and I do everything and then I don't get it and then people don't have a plan B, that was bad for small businesses. It was bad uh, for their employees. So the good we'll come back to, we will be going back to Washington. The Senate is there now. We are working on a plan that you will hear all across the news that will be called going big and going bold, putting more money back in, hopefully correcting what we missed the first time, specifically as it relates to your question and minority uh, small businesses. I can assure you that Congresswoman Maxine Waters, first time we have had a African-American and female to chair one of the most prestigious committees that we have in Congress dealing with this, our small business committee chaired by a Hispanic uh, female, they have decided to work together. Uh, Congresswoman Maxine Waters has let her subcommittee chair people weigh in. And I'm proud to say uh, the majority of us are African-American or a minority. So when you couple the vice chair of the Small Business Committee, Dwight Evans, Congressman Evans from Pennsylvania, and Joyce Beatty from Ohio uh, with our work in Congress and both of us being on the executive board of the Congressional Black Caucus, I can make a strong commitment for advocacy and fight. And because organizations like your organization, you're reaching out and while you're holding us accountable, you are also uniting and working with us in the fight. We have united with more teletown halls than any other group has done through the Congressional Black Caucus and Congresswoman Karen Bass from California is our chairperson. Name it, civil rights, mayors, uh, small businesses, not-for-profits, all talking about how we can protect those small businesses that continue to spearhead our economy. And I know that was a lot, but that wow. question within itself, if we're gonna ask people to lean in, then we need to help them understand getting back in that queue. Don't get totally frustrated. I understand the frustration, but you have to continue to fill out the paperwork. Far too many small businesses did not have the basics. I had businesses calling me saying they didn't know what their payroll had been for 2018 or 2019. They didn't have very basic documentation of how much they had paid themselves if they were a really small business with one or two employees. And then we have to do, collectively we, have to do a better job of educating them on what they can deduct, what goes into that loan process, how much is forgivable or with a low or no interest rate? What are the allowables? And sometimes it is very complex for a small business without legal assistance or without an on-site CPA uh, type of individual. That's, you mentioned a really good point. As we start thinking about how do we bring these small businesses back into the workforce, because we all see now that we're focused on recovery and opening back up the economy. That's a big push right now. Um, and we're still trying to figure out how we get these minority businesses, particularly to sustain their operations, to even get to reopen. But in the event that this does happen, we're thinking of how do we make sure that they have the necessary resources in place to support their employees? As you start looking at some of the things such as testing kits, thermometers, heat sensing cameras, all those things are going to be necessary to keep people safe until we can have broader testing uh, availability and resources out there. We know folks are, you know, some folks need to get back to work. We don't want to put them in a position of choosing stay healthy or stay broke. You know, we don't, we're trying to make sure that they have everything they can to stay safe. 
one of the questions that came up from our constituents, has there been any consideration given to having tax credits for businesses that are purchasing equipment to keep their workforce safe? And we know that some of our minority businesses actually have solutions for this, but is that something that can be considered? Oh, absolutely. And I'm glad you asked that question uh, because it parallels with people not knowing what they can deduct, what's allowable. So a tax credit is one way that we could incentivize uh, businesses uh, to take the necessary uh, approaches to reopening. Uh, but I think also government has to pay, play a part in, in that as well. Because, because here's what we know. If we don't have testing available for everyone, if we don't put the testing in urban centers, in urban communities, if you say today in many states across the United States, if you want to get this test, one, you have to contact a primary physician and you have to go to a hospital and you have to have one of the allowable symptoms. Now, that's a lot of assumptions for even some well-educated people. So it's not to do the layering of a small business falls in this category. I can tell you that many of my peers, if you ask them today, tell me who your primary physician is. Many people wouldn't know, or if they would know, oh, it's Dr. So-and-so, they wouldn't have a cell phone or a contact, and doctors are working from home they wouldn't know how to necessarily contact them. So I think one of the things that we are saying, and I think we will get some victories in, is that we have to put testing centers in our communities. Uh, Kroger's has done an amazing job. Uh, I know here in Ohio, by partnering with some of our city and county uh, health services, and they are throughout uh, the community in non-traditional places, and it's free and they are doing those tests. So I, I think we have to have work sites. I think we have to have mobiles. I'm going back to work. Let's say I'm opening up, which we are getting ready to do uh, here in Ohio, and many states have already opened up for barbershops and hair salons and small uh, spas and restaurants, small mom and pop restaurants to open up. Then I think we have to go the extra mile in the next funding and be able to supply them with many of those PPEs that they need, that they don't have to uh, have those expenses because you can be a very small restaurant or a hair or barber salon. And, and let's say you, you have 10 or, or 20 people come in during the course of a couple of days that you're open. But think about the number of masks you have to have. Think about the gowns and they're not reusable that you would have to have those supplies that you've already been out of business for weeks and weeks, and there is no reserve. You haven't received your unemployment or the new $600 a week yet, or you didn't uh, make the list to get a PPP. You don't have that those extra dollars. So I, I think we have to do a better job in government. I think you will see a lot of that being adopted uh, in our new legislation that's coming out of small business and financial services, I think you will see some of my legislation put uh, into the next funding cycle bill that will help us. But what really helps us, you giving us this information and asking us the question. I have executive uh, members of my team who are listening and they will then take the questions and the responses and put it into the hopper for when we go back into Congress next week. Excellent. Thank you for that. One of the things I think is um, important, we were having, we've been having conversations with uh, SBA, uh, Treasury Department, not sure if you're aware, but NMSDC actually has its own funding arm, a business consortium fund that is a CDFI, that is geared specifically to serve minority businesses. A question that has come up from our constituents, and it's, it's a question that came up on the round table we had with the White House earlier, uh, and it's a question they want me to pose to you today. We know that some of these larger companies have gotten funds they, that were not intended for them, and they have, they're making provisions to give those monies back. Could those monies be earmarked specifically for minority-owned businesses, and how can we establish a process to allow that to happen? 
I think you should start lobbying uh, as soon as we get off that call. <laughs> all of those organizations signing a letter, sending it to the majority and the minority, because I could tell you, if it were up to me, absolutely. When we're getting the millions and millions of dollars uh, from the Lakers and all of the high-end restaurants, I am not in favor of putting it just back into the hopper. I am in favor of putting it into a carve out. And more specifically for me, while I'm all for, I want to say this twice, I'm all for MDIs, I'm all for CDIFs, and I really fought hard for those carve outs. Now I want a carve out for African American and my other minority small businesses that they could go and apply. And then I want that stagnated. I want that because I don't want to ever leave the impression that we aren't in the great in the big numbers. We have fought too hard. And there are African American and other minority businesses that are exceptional, they're successful, they've worked hard and earned their right to have a seat at the big table. But we also have businesses who are on their way to the big table. And so I want carve outs that would say for 25 uh, employees and less, uh, 100 to 50 or 75. We've done it with the allocations. We've done it in healthcare where we've broken out the dollar amounts and those dollars that would be returned could also be in addition to I don't want to send a message that we only want to be dependent on that. We need to have a dollar amount it's just for the small businesses, minority, and add those additional dollars in. So what you could do is have $250 billion additional dollars coming in for small businesses and then do within that $200 billion, this for 25 and less to make sure or, or put them in a better position uh, to be able to compete and actually retrie retrieve some of the dollars. Excellent. Thank you. And I guess my last question for you would be, um, one of the things that we're looking to do at NMSDC is we're going to be standing up what we're calling a Minority Wealth Commission. And this commission will work with other uh, like-minded advocacy groups that will help us understand how do we come up with two, three, maybe five at the most key measures that represent the totality of minority businesses across this country. So we're already starting to partner with Rainbow Push with Reverend Jesse Jackson, the National Action Network with Reverend Al Sharpton, the Ethnic Chambers, and actually it's gonna be led by um, the former director of uh, MBDA, Henry Childs. He's gonna come in and kind of coordinate that on our behalf, working under NMSDC. What is, what's the best way for us to to use the inputs from that group to provide to the Congressional Black Caucus, other congressional leaders, to make sure that we're giving you this information so that it represents the body of our minority businesses into a singular point that can then be used to maybe help inform the next round of legislation. What's well, the best practice? Well, let me just say thank you for even thinking about including us. Uh, in February, through the leadership of Congresswoman Karen Bass and our executive team and, and all then 54 uh, of our CBC members, we held a Black America Summit because what we wanted people to know is we are out here advocating and what's so important as of Tuesday, so just two days ago, uh, we are now back up to our 55 membership. Uh, of the Congressional Black Caucus, the largest caucus within the entire uh, Congress. And so what I would say is let's join forces. As we are doing our tele-town halls, we should, and I will take a leadership because just yesterday during our meetings, we have not stopped. Uh, Congresswoman Bass has continued to hold our full weekly Congressional Black Caucus meetings. She just asked us if there is another forum that we want to host or do that would help us with data, that would help us with advocacy, education and awareness, or really making a difference for small uh, minority businesses, then we should be in that engagement. It is very timely because our very first Teletown Hall in relationship to COVID-19 was with all of the people that you just mentioned. Uh, they were all, we started with our civil rights and advocacy groups. They were all on that call 
trying to set the stage in the direction for where we should go. So I think we should offline uh, put our leadership together. And I certainly can make a commitment today that we are leaning in to make sure that we are working with you because we know that we have the lack of capital uh, oftentimes. And also it's so important for us to advocate for our platforms and to ask people as you prioritize, make sure that you prioritize for minority businesses. Thank you so much, Congresswoman Beatty. We thank you for your leadership, your support, your advocacy, all that you are doing to be that voice for those who don't have a voice or a seat at the table. Just gonna ask you just to give us a few closing remarks and then we'll let you get back to your busy day. Well, first of all, let me start with the two most important words that I was always taught to say, and that's thank you. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your vision. But most importantly, we are truly in this together. And I believe that we will come out stronger if we continue to work together, but our work is far from being done. Thank you so much, Congresswoman, appreciate it. Thank you all for joining us again. Um, this has been just an engaging conversation. So many insights we've been able to gather from this and we really appreciate you taking the time. Um, for those of you who've been on the journey with us over these last six weeks, we appreciate you tuning in for our town halls. We wanted to make sure that we were getting you timely, updated, relevant information coming directly from the leaders of, of, our, of the federal government, such as Congresswoman Beatty. So we thank you for tuning in. And again, if you've missed any of them, you can always go back to nmsdc.org or nmsdccares.org, where all of these sessions are recorded and you can reference them. We will be taking a break next week because we're gonna start pivoting and shifting to get ready for our leadership series that will be unveiled. So again, we thank you for, the, for tuning in. I want to say thank you to our partners, uh, Don McNeely with Minority Business News for, for sponsoring our post and bringing all this information together. I want to thank the NMSDC team for all they have done to pull these together so that we are getting information to you and confirming the speakers, great content, making sure that we had good production and good information to be able to share with all of you. Um, thank you again for tuning in. We want to make sure that you stay tuned so that you know what's going on with future NMSDC information and events. And again, we have our MBE survey that's out there. So for those of you who have not taken the survey yet, please make sure you take the survey. As you just heard from this exchange, our data is critical to help inform our leaders who are out there advocating on our behalf in terms of how they can help us. That's the data that we're collecting and that's the data that they are using as they take forward recommendations for putting in place legislation that's gonna support all of you. So thank you all again for joining in. Have a wonderful day, stay safe, stay healthy, and remember, hashtag Minority Business Matters.